it's crazy to me that, you know, you turn on the news and everyone's talking about what could we do to bring more people to family medicine and how are we going to solve Canada's family medicine crisis? And the government doesn't care about showing you exactly what to do. Like if, if you build the inferior codes, the government's not going to flag you and say, hey, take more money because you actually did this work. <laughs> just finished and it's time for a break. How's it going everyone? Welcome back to the channel. I think today's video is going to be maybe the first of its kind here on YouTube. It, it's something that I'm making this in the structure, the way that I wish that I had been able to see for myself as I was going through it. Basically, we have four months left for residency. I have the Canadian boards coming up in April. The USMLE, the American Step 3, is next week. So Monday and Friday, it's a two-day exam uh, appetizer before the Canadian boards and I have to go see my patients in my office in about seven hours because I just did my practice exam on New World today. Uh, I'll show you my score from that and I just did my corrections, came back from the gym, gonna get a little bit of sleep, wake up super early and uh, go in and see everyone. So I'm gonna turn the camera around now, and figure this out. This is the uh, UWorld exam number two and I'm tracking at about the 60th percentile with 66% correct. And the way I use these U-rolled exams is I always just go based off of the percentile rank and not the score here, because I found that with the other um, U-rolled, like USMLE exams, they don't actually correlate with the score that you're going to get, and they'll tell you that. But basically, 60th percentile looks like I'm, I'm sitting pretty well right now before the exam. So you all actually have that vlog next weekend, I, I think, because uh, I'm going to take the, the camera with me and we'll see what it's like. i got to drive to the States to write that one. But for today, what I want to talk about is that final little bit of transition to practice. This will probably be a two-part video, one now and one maybe about a month before I get started. Uh, but we're going to go over contract negotiations, like kind of what it's like setting up the office and figuring out what days you want to work and everything like that, overhead costs, and then we'll go into specifics later on, but this will be general kind of things that you need to think about if you're going to be a family doctor, if you ever wanted to know what it's like being a family doctor that's setting up an office. Okay, so the first thing that I want to start off in saying is that all throughout residency, I've heard from other people, and then I might have even said here on the channel that the last couple months are some of the easier times of your residency as things start to slow down. And that is objectively not true now that I'm here. I would say in my entire residency so far, probably the only busier time that I've had is during my ICU rotations. But between getting ready for the board exams and the, well, especially the Canadian exams, that's really the important one that most people are going to be worried about at this point. Um, what you need to do is, is kind of come up with your triage list in terms of things that are most important all the way down to least important. And the top tier priorities right now are making sure that you have the medicine down packed. The medicine is always the priority. So especially now towards the end, yes, it's exam studying, but also getting in with different specialists and using your status as a resident really helps you out here. So for example, if you want a little bit of in-depth specialized training for occipital nerve blocks and then subspecialized topics like covering headaches in pregnancy specifically, then you get to use your status as a resident to go in and work with the specialists. On top of that though, you gotta be speaking to your lawyers, your accountants, setting up the practice that you're either gonna be walking into or taking over or building up from scratch. And yeah, it, it's really a busy time the last couple of months. And anyone that says otherwise, um, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe you didn't do a lot of the stuff now, but then you have to worry about that when you're staff. And then when you're staff, there's so much else going on. So I would really recommend, instead of slowing down towards the end of residency, really ramp things up and make sure that you're on the ball so that when you become staff, you kind of just hit the ground running after that. Hey guys, 
so our guy, my guy lined up that day. It's uh, lung cancer screening and follow-up, which to me was very confusing. Like very confusing, more so than some of the other ones because there was mm -hmm. quite significant conflict between a few of the different guidelines. So I tried to break it down in terms of what I think you will need to know um, for the exam. So, just finished up at the university campus. And now, I'm gonna be going back to my office to do after hours clinic, which is a really cool service that we offer people. That way, if they get sick at nighttime, so like after five o'clock, they don't have to go to the emerge. There's always someone in our network that keeps their clinic open Monday to Saturday till about eight or 8.30 at night uh, to see them for anything that's, that's low acuity that you don't need to go to the hospital for, which is good. Uh, today we did presentation. So with the Canadian exams coming around, each of the different residents will teach, will, will lead like a study group session and will teach each other one of the guidelines that are coming up on the test. So uh, guidelines for anticoagulation with atrial fibrillation or uh, today I was doing lung nodules and follow up for low dose CT scans and screening for lung cancer and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, another four hours still to go for, for work. So the last two things that I want to talk about in today's video, really, really important. And that is the concept number one of contract negotiations. And number two is the first few months of working as an actual family doctor. Once you get out of residency in regards to contract negotiations, the first thing that I'll say is that on average, the CMA published statistic for the overhead on average for family doctors in Canada is about 27%. And what that means is that out of everything that you are billing for the year, you are going to have to pay more than a quarter just to keep the, the business open. And then an additional about third of your income to taxes and government fees and agency fees and all of these different things, meaning that it is your responsibility to keep your overhead as low as is possible to keep your business open. And I see on the news, all of these family doctors, their offices closing down. And, and there's many different reasons why that is. One thing that I'll say is that I've spoken to family doctors in their first year who have told me that they were locked into contracts with 40% overhead or 37% overhead. And at that point, it becomes very, very difficult to turn a profit. And I think that a lot of this could be avoided if people took the time beforehand to do the research and to look into exactly where the money is going. And if you can justify those added expenses for your overhead, then you get to decide whether or not you want to sign that contract or not sign that contract. But it's really important that you do your research before you sign anything. You talk to your accountants, you talk to your lawyers, and that you find a place that's going to save you as much money on overhead expenses as is possible. A few of you might've seen some of my other videos, but my central philosophy here, my thought is that if you want to get more people to go into family medicine, you need to teach them how to be successful family doctors. And a big part of that is their business acumen and running a business itself. And no one's helping you with that. Not in medical school, not the government. No one's reaching out how to tell you these things. So I'll tell you really quickly what I think that you should do. When you're looking at setting up a practice, when you're looking at signing on somewhere, the first thing that you want to do is go on to Google and look at some listings in your area as to how much rent is going for in your area. You want to talk to other doctors and ask them how much they're paying for rent at their buildings. And that was really helpful for me as well. I had a lot of family doctors that reached out or that I reached out to them and they answered me and, and let me know how much rent was in the area approximately. And that gave me a little bit of an edge in terms of contract negotiations and, and thinking uh, how much I should be paying an overhead at all these different places that I'm looking at signing to. Because the second thing is, when I say that I'm going to be opening my own practice, I will be opening my own practice, but there are other doctors there. And, and that's what you want. You want to be at a place with other doctors so that you can split your overhead up evenly. And that way, not one person is being crushed with all of the overhead for the entire building. The second piece of this, and I cannot stress this enough, is you need to understand how billing works in terms of medicine here in Canada. You could have two people that work the exact same job and see the exact same people, hypothetically. You see the exact same every single day, all your patients are the exact same, you're doing the exact same, and you will have one person that will make, you know, in some cases, maybe 50% more than this other person that was doing the exact same thing. And the reason is, is because you don't get paid per hour for the most part. If you're doing locum work, that's something different. But if you are billing yourself, you get paid depending on the codes that you submit for the work that you did. 
Now there are certain codes, so you could have instances where you could bill an A007, which is a general assessment, that will pay one thing, it's about $37, $38. Uh, and on the other hand, you could, instead of billing the A007, you could bill codes that still covers the same amount of work that you did, but they are more specific for exactly what you did and they pay more money. And if you don't understand the difference between those two codes in many instances, you're going to be losing just so much money over time. And I think that's a really important reason why you have to do this work ahead of time so that starting when you start working, you're not losing just thousands of dollars every single month in terms of codes that you should be billing. I would even recommend, you know, looking online, different resources, there's a lot of different good companies out there as well. You might even want to look into talking to a billing agent in the first little bit and just whatever you're paying them, especially for the first few months, from what I've seen anyways, will really help you later on in terms of learning the proper way to bill. But those are just my thoughts and that's my checklist in terms of what I think people should be doing when you're coming up on those last few months before you start your actual practice and how you can set yourself up for success. It's crazy to me that, you know, you turn on the news and everyone's talking about what could we do to bring more people to family medicine and how are we going to solve Canada's family medicine crisis? And the government doesn't care about showing you exactly what to do. Like if you build the inferior codes, the government's not going to flag you and say, hey, take more money because you actually did this work. They're going to just make you not get paid and it's your fault for not seeing it. And on the other hand, if you're too aggressive with your billing, then you get audited, right? So it's a really difficult time in the beginning, but I want to say it, it does pay off. And even though we're talking about contract negotiations and learning the billing codes and all this other additional work that I have to do, on top of studying for all my board exams coming up, um, I have done the math for myself and I, I still i am very excited about the specialty, uh, very excited about my job starting in, in July and also very excited about the people that I'm going to work with. Uh, I found a place that's like amazing. Um, we work things out very, very well. And, on, and in addition to the overhead and, and everything else that we talked about, you want to find a place that you're going to enjoy going to work uh, to some degree and find a group of people that, that you like working with. And thankfully I found that as well. But if you guys have any questions about anything we talked about today, feel free to leave that in the comment section below. I know it's a little bit of a strange, maybe niche video. Maybe not all of you might have got something from it, but to the few of you that did want to learn a little bit more, I hope it was helpful. Uh, I'll see you all in the next one. Uh, wish me luck. Everyone take care.